Welcome aboard, everybody. Last time we read, we found out that Robert found his way back to Moscow. Um, he almost was on the verge of death. He survived, thankfully. And now we're getting towards the end of World War II. And I'm glad to see Jake back. So yeah, we're back in action and we're back to discussing this book, which is a good. Because now we're getting towards the end of this now we're getting towards the end of World War II. Pretty soon the Nazis are going to be defeated and we're going to see a new Soviet age. So it will be interesting to see where that's going to take us. It's going to definitely take us on a very interesting journey. So let's find our way to the, to the chapter and then we are good to go. So we're going to start with chapter 18 today, which is the remaining war years. The funny thing about uh, the last chapter where you weren't around, Jake, is um, they had these things called Roosevelt's eggs, which were powdered eggs. And uh, the Russian people were joking that it was Roosevelt's nuts crushed up and grounded. <laughs> and they called it Yaitsa. It was pretty quite, it was quite funny. So chapter 18, the remaining war years. German planes were still pounding Moscow with bombs. Often when I was walking home after my engineering classes, shells from incendiary bombs would fall all around me. There were times when they dropped in such rapid succession that I would stand and up and just and wait for the next one to fall on my head. At first, I ran for protection into alleys or doorways or around corners. But after a while, I could see that no place was any safer than another. Houses were crumbling everywhere. Besides, waiting in a Moscow street in late autumn or winter for a bombing raid to end was risky business. There was always the possibility of freezing to death, and after a few weeks, I simply ignored the bombs and continued walking all the way home, praying all the while. But avoiding the rain of Nazi bombs was not the only problem I faced. There was a wartime curfew of 9 o'clock, but my classes did not end until 9.45, as a result, policemen arrested me 14 times, hauling me into the nearest station where I underwent the same routine. While the arresting officer would report to his superior, I was made to wait with thieves, molesters, assorted perverts, and other curfew breakers. That's so stupid. Why would class end at 945 if the curfew was at 9 p.m.? You would think they would end the class at 830 so people could get home on time. That's just so dumb. Standing before the night supervising officer always humiliated me. Without fail, the officer would stare at me as if I were some strange animal who most likely escaped from a zoo. The police would take down my name, my place of work, and then call the plant to verify my story. Then when the police learned of my record of service, the awards and recommendations I had received, they congratulated me, sometimes even shaking my hand. They would then warn me not to break curfew again. One officer told me, you see, Comrade Robinson, we haven't got many of your people here. Hence, you create a false impression at night since it's so dark. I'm sorry, but I'm sure you understand. I have been a very good report about you. I never knew that we had such a highly skilled persons like you helping us beat the Nazis. But I can't let you go now because you'll meet the same trouble again before reaching home. You had better sit on that chair in the corner until 5.30 a.m., and then you may go. One night during the winter of 43 to 44, the thermometer registered at 3 degrees Fahrenheit. When I entered the engineering college, but the by the time the classes were over, the temperature had dropped to minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Public transportation stopped running at 9 p.m. because of the curfew, so I always faced a six-mile walk home. When I stepped out of the building, the wind was razor sharp, I wrapped my wooden scarf around my head and placed my wooden cap on top, then wrapped the ends of the scarf around my neck, buttoned up, and raised my collar around my ears and face. Only my eyes and nose were left exposed to the bitter cold. Usually when it was this cold, I would run home, but the evening snow had turned to ice and it was slippery and dangerous. By the time I had walked about five miles, I could feel my hands getting cold. I placed my briefcase under my arm and put my hands inside my overcoat. I walked 
I kept walking as fast as I could, all the time trying to keep my balance. When I reached the door of my apartment, I pulled out my hands, and there was absolutely no feeling in them. I kicked the door with my foot, and the neighbors inside demanded, Who is it? Open the door, please, I shouted. It's Robinson. Quick, let me in. When one of the neighbors opened the door and saw me rubbing my hands, he guessed what had happened. He pulled my gloves off and, without saying a word, led me into the kitchen. He put both of my hands under the cold water, rubbed them vigorously for half an hour. Gradually, the feelings began to return. Tremendous pain started shooting through my palms. I was in agony. My hands, which had been green, slowly became red again. At this point, my neighbor said, We've done it. You're lucky. Your hands are saved. Until the Germans surrendered, my routine was such that I rarely got enough sleep. Between working as much overtime as possible, attending classes and staying at home and trying to find enough to eat, after my six-mile walk or run home from classes, it would be about 10.30 or 11 p.m. I would then study for two hours or more before going to sleep. To get to work on time, I had to leave my room at 5.30 a.m., so there were times when I would only sleep for an hour or two. In the winter months, my room would be so cold that I would usually sleep fully clothed. I would also get place a basin of water on the gas stove to generate some warmth and moisture in the room. So I would sleep for no more than an hour at a time, afraid that I might either freeze to death or be asphyxiated by the gas. Many nights, I would go to the treatment department of the plant to stay warm. I had learned that many factory workers went there to sleep. When I first decided to try it out, I found the department crowded with people between those who were there seeking warmth and others who worked the night shift and were taking a break near the furnaces to keep warm. Some people th bought, brought potatoes from the private gardens and baked them in ovens. They would break them in half and sprinkle salt all over them and then would eat with warm slices of black bread and fresh cucumber. Such a meal was a real treat. Having discovered the heat treatment department, I would go there often during the day to warm my hands and feet. One time, I ventured too close to the furnace and my overcoat caught on fire. The workers quickly threw sand on me and put the fire out, but I was left with a three-inch hole in the front of my coat, making it useless for keeping out of the extreme winter cold. Still, I had nothing else to wear for the next four and a half months because it took a tool shop trade unions committee three months to get me in order to go to the tailoring shop and have a new overcoat made. And then it took the tailor six weeks to finish the job. After a while, I decided to study and do my homework in the heat department, not only, after, not only for the warmth, but also because it was better lit. From mid-1942, houses were supplied with only 40 watt bulbs, which made it difficult to study for long periods of time without damaging one's eyesight. Many times during the war, the superintendent asked me to come back to my work after my evening classes and help on some project. One was paid for overtime work beyond 12 hours and entitled to supplementary ration coupons as well. Worth 200 grams, seven ounces of black bread, 25 grams, 88 ounces of meat, and a boiled potato and five grams of butter or vegetable oil. However, for all the overtime work I put in, I never received either form of compensation. I never asked for what was owed to me because I knew that would be a sure way to create resentment against me. Even though I had a Soviet passport, I would always be a foreigner. I had always to consider my actions carefully. I could readily imagine the banner headline in the factory newspaper, Robinson refuses to help, demands double pay and ration coupons. One such headline would be the reason enough for the authorities to send me to the front or to labor camps. Such injustices occurred regularly. Why should I be exempt? On the spring of 1944, the Council of Ministers order a factory to operate 24 hours a day to produce chisels for pneumatic hammers. These hammers were to be used for the bituminous coal basin near Moscow. All available machines were to be put to use grinding the upper parts of the chisels. The superintendent asked me to return after classes to grind more chisels. And of course, I agreed. This meant that I was now working 11 hours from early morning to nearly 6 p.m., after which I would run to catch the streetcar, then transfer to another one to get to my 6.50 class. When classes ended at 9.45 p.m., I would walk the six miles back to the factory in the dark 
and then began to work on a pile of forged chisels until 4.30 in the morning. When I was ready to go to drop, then I would go to the heat treatment plant, nap for an hour, get up, eat the seven ounces of black bread I carried in my pocket, go wash my face, and go back to work. Although I worked overtime grinding chisels from the beginning of March 1944 until the end of April of 45, only once did I receive an additional meal, meal coupon, which I gave to a neighbor who I felt needed it more than I did. Unlike other workers, I never received a Kopeck for my labors. Now imagine most people working under these conditions today and see how they would handle that because I don't think they could. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty funny, isn't it? Um, can you remove one of my articles? I was actually thinking about reviewing a couple of your articles, but yeah, um, I can check that one out for sure. Finally, the curfew was lifted in 1944, and with the coming of spring, getting to and from classes was no longer a barely endurable ordeal. On a warm, sunny day, in June in 1944, I was riding the train on the Engineering Institute, Institute with my friend Libschitz. We were both in our final course before taking the mechanical engineering qualifying examination. The tram was moving slowly, and my friend and I decided we had a better jump off and hurry to class on foot. We jumped off in the midst of heavy traffic and sped across a wide road against a light that had just turned red. There was a policeman direct there directing traffic but we did not think he had noticed us. As we hurried off to get to class on time, we heard a police whistle, but did not think it was intended for us. Then about a block from the college, we saw two men dashing across the street toward us. We stopped and they pounced on us. Alarmed, we demanded, what do you think you're doing? One of them motioned with his head and said, there's a policeman coming after you. In the Soviet Union, you are obliged by the law to try to help a policeman if he is chasing someone. Failure to do so could result in a severe fine or a few days in jail. For this reason, the two men held us tightly until the policeman ran up out of breath and said to us, Citizens, be kind enough to show me your documents. Immediately, I was gripped by fear. I was not certain that I had my documents. I felt my pants pocket and they were not there. Although I knew that I had left them at home, I searched my briefcase for the benefit of the policeman. Libschitz was in the same predicament. After all the trouble I went through earlier for not carrying my documents, here I am, caught without them again, I thought. How stupid. The policeman told us without your documents, you were illegally walking the streets. For that, you were under arrest. Lipschitz and I looked at each other, both feeling like fools. I was irritated at the policeman for bothering to come after us for such a minor offense. As we were escorted to the station house, I realized that the two of us had probably looked a little strange dashing across the street with our black briefing cases. Lipschitz, who was wearing a large dark glasses, was completely bald, had a long bushy black beard, and was wider than his white face. And here I was besides him, a black man with a large mound of dark hair when we were entering the station. The cluster of criminal suspects and handcuffs took one look at us and immediately stopped talking. They had probably never seen a stranger looking pair of human beings in their life. <laughs> Nor for that matter had the police station superintendent who was seated behind a high desk peering down at us. The arresting policeman told the superintendent what had happened. In desperation, Lipschitz showed the superintendent his college pass. These are not real documents, said the superintendent without looking at the pass. He then rang the bell and another policeman appeared. Take this citizen and find out where his document is. As Lipschitz was escorted down the hallway, he turned back to me, his eyes silently pleading for help. I was left with the superintendent's desk. I would look up at the officer and catch him staring curiously at my hair. Whenever our eyes met, his face would flush and we would quickly look down at the papers in front of him or pretend to sweep away the dust or crumbs from his desk. Suddenly, I heard a terrible piercing scream. It was Lipschitz. I glanced at the superintendent who did not flinch. Another scream forced me to close my eyes and grit my teeth. Fifteen minutes later, Lipschitz appeared sobbing with a policeman at his side. The officer saluted the superintendent and declared, Everything is all right. Lipschitz stood beside me, obviously in pain, crying softly. 
The superintendent looked at us harshly and said, I advise both of you to carry your documents always. It will save you from further arrest and unpleasantness. Isn't that freaking lovely? Imagine living like that, having to carry documents everywhere. And if you don't, you get arrested and tortured. I mean, that's bullshit, man. A self-satisfied smile creased his face as he added, You are both free to go. As soon as we were outside the police station, Lipschitz burst into tears. There was nothing I could say to comfort him. I placed my hand on his shoulder, and we walked in silence to the college entrance. Then he turned to me with an anguished look that made me swear never to tell anyone what had just happened. Classes that evening were a blur. All I could think of was the frightened, helpless, pleading look on Lipschitz's face as he was driven, as he was led down the corridor to the, of the police station and his sobbing when he returned. As soon as class was over, I ran to find my friend and he was standing with a group of his classmates who were trying to persuade him to go someplace with them. I could tell he was relieved to see me because it gave him an easy way to excuse himself from them. We left the building together and began walking silently along the tram car route. His anguish coupled with my concern kept us silent, but I wanted desperately to know what had happened. Finally, I asked him for a long moment. He said nothing. Then he told me I was taken down the corridor. We stopped at a door, which was open. The officer besides me asked me, asked the one inside the room to come with them. We continued to walk down the hallway until we reached a room with a padlock on it. The second officer unlocked it. We went inside. It was a small place. Ropes and belts hung from the wall. There was a tall post in one corner with hooks on it. When I was told to remove my shirt and undershirt, I saw one of the officers take two belts from the wall. I was terrified because I thought they were going to whip me. Instead, they used the belts to strap me to a post. One of the policemen told me to look up the ceiling. Then they grabbed my beard and yanked it repeatedly. Then one of them braced his foot against the wall and gave a mighty yank. I screamed for my life. They tried this a few more times and then put some kind of contraption on my beard. The gadget produced pain that was unbearable. I screamed until I could bear it no more, and then I fainted. So yeah, that's pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No documents, comrade? Say yes to torture. But that's insane. They strapped him down. And then they pulled his beard, and then they put a device on him to cause the most amount of pain as possible until the point that he fainted. When I came to, I was lying on the floor, and the two men were sponging my face with cold water. Finally, they sat me up while I was unconscious. One of them had called our factory to verify what I had told them about working there. He apologized for torturing me and said, since the war, we found spies wearing false beards mustaches and hair because you and your friend look so different we had no alternative but to check out your beard to see if it was <laughs> that sounds like some cartoon or comedy movie shit right there it's like oh we thought you might have been a spy we didn't know that was a real beard so we just had to see if it was not long after this unfortunate incident in july 1944 after seven years of study at the moscow evening institute the all-important day arrived. I sat before a panel of seven professors, four from the Institute and three from the State Ministry of Education. They examined me on my final mechanical engineering project. To my surprise, each one asked only three questions, which I answered readily. Then I had to wait outside the examination room while the professors deliberated. The final decision is based on all the grades during the entire course of study and an assessment of how the final project was completed and defended. In Russia, a 15-minute wait for something would be considered extraordinarily short, but in that each minute seemed like an hour. This examination was now all that stood between me and a degree as a full-time mechanical engineer. Finally, I was summoned back to the examination room. I was too nervous to sit down. No one was smiling. Oh no, I thought. I probably failed even though I was certain I had answered the questions correctly. Still, during the seven years at the Institute, I had learned that doing something right was not always a guarantee that you would pass. I had failed the laboratory examination and electricity three times. 
even though I knew the subject matter inside and out. A teaching assistant was instructing us in the lab. When I told a friend of mine about my problem, he laughed and asked me, Comrade Robinson, did you, the assistant ask you to consult him about the examination every time he failed you? Well, yes, I answered, somewhat puzzled. Let me explain. You have violated the unwritten rule of institute. You see, the man asked you to consult with him because every time a student comes to him for extra help, he receives 10 extra rubles from the institute for tutoring. He expects you to meet with him at least three times. That way he has receives 30 rubles. I took my friend's advice, met with the assistant three times, and asked to take the examination again, this time with the same answers as before I passed. But now standing before the panel of professors was an ordeal. I knew the Russian penchant for holding people in suspense. They seemed to derive a certain pleasure from watching someone squirm. I knew I should have relaxed and let them play their game, but I was too tense, too emotionally involved to maintain an inner calm. Each professor made a statement about me. Then the chairman of the group, Comrade Robinson, you have graduated with the grade of B. They all rose and congratulated me. One of them said, your diploma will be ready in a month. Please come by for it then. The next few days, I moved about, about as if in a dream. For the first time since the food rationing, I thought little of eating. I kept thinking over and over. Now I am a college-educated mechanical engineer. I wrote my mother immediately, knowing how the good news would cheer her. She was getting older, and I had not seen her in 11 years. Now that I had my degree, I vowed myself that as soon as the war was over, I would find a way to get back home and see her. On the day I was to pick up my diploma, I rushed to the institute right after work, skipping supper. But when I reported to the registrar's office, instead of a diploma, I was handed a slip of paper. It said that I was to report to a factory in Stalingrad and that I would be paid 800 rubles a month. I was to live in a hostel with three other engineers. This would be a career setback, not an advancement. In Moscow, I was making 1,200 rubles a month and I had my own room. I rejected the offer. As a result, I was not given my diploma. During the next two years, I made several protests to the Institute's administration, but I got nowhere. Then I wrote the director of my factory and asked him to intercede. He did, and a month later, I received a postcard from the Institute saying I could pick up my diploma. This time, when I went to the registrar's office, it was given to me. In the Soviet Union, a diploma is much more than a piece of paper stating that a student has graduated. It is a folder containing your transcript of courses and grades as well. It is signed by the dean and the party secretary of the institute, and it has the seal of the Ministry of Education. If an official asks to see your diploma, you must show him the folder with all its contents. A certificate or diploma alone does not suffice. Other students were less fortunate. Those without influential connections and who had passed all their subjects but refused to take the assignment offered were never allowed to practice engineering professionally. I knew young, one young woman who took a job in Moscow sweeping streets, a young man who joined the road construction crew rather than accepting unappealing assignments. Beginning in 1938, night college students at the institutes had to pay 100 rubles a semester. So it was not that the government so it was not that the government was paying for a student's education in return for work commitment. Most students felt, as I did, that a person paying for his education should have a say in where he works. My education cost me 1,200 rubles. In addition to technical knowledge I gained, I learned quite a bit about the Soviet educational system. Well, there goes the narrative of free college. That, no free college there. No free college for you, comrade. Oh, hey, Amari. Um, doing well. I just need a lot more sleep, which I hopefully will get today later on. But yeah, no free college, comrade. You'll pay. Soviet country picks job for you. Job picks you. Anyways, my education cost me 1,200 rubles. In addition to the technical knowledge I gained, I learned quite a lot about the Soviet education system. It has a much narrower, fo narrower focus than Western systems. Narrow. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, always, I always gripe and moan about that. You guys know too well I gripe and moan about that narrow stuff. 
The only non-technical courses taught during my seven years were the mandatory two-year courses, the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and political economy, because most of the students had attended elementary school and high school in the Russian hinterland, where instruction was extremely provincial, they left the institute as ignorant as the rest of the world as when they entered. No, they left the institute as ignorant of the rest of the world as when they entered. So they didn't really learn much of anything other than just how to work and party propaganda. Wow, some education that is. They ended up well-grounded in their particular technical program, but they did not know a thing about the humanities. Not only were most of them unaware of where Indonesia or Jamaica was, for example, but what was more shocking and disturbing was that they lacked the desire to learn more about the rest of the world with its many different peoples and cultures. Yikesy, yikesy. <laughs> that is, that's really funny. They didn't know where Jamaica and Indonesia was on a map. <laughs> Nor did they learn about anyone else's culture. It's all about the party. Since the October Revolution of 1917, millions of people have been educated through the Soviet system from kindergarten to old age. Everyone is exposed to a constant barrage of political indoctrination. Soviet students soon learn that they are not allowed to think freely or question dogma without running into trouble with authorities. As a result, their viewpoints remain narrow. Whether they are, whether they are in service to the advancement of the state is of primary importance. The point was to dedicate one's life to helping Mother Russia achieve what was taught its so-called sacred mission, to achieve world domination, even if achieving the goal took 100 years. Developing individual intellectual potential is not a priority. Nope, that's only reserved for the leader and maybe a few lackeys and that's it. Soviet education does not stress the development of a well-rounded development mind. Do you hear that, folks? Soviet education does not stress the development of a well-rounded developed mind. For this reason... The Soviet intelligentsia is different from the intellectual elite in the West. This is an important point which the West needs to understand. Something the West doesn't understand then, nor do they understand now, because there's a bunch of apologetics that try to say, oh, oh, oh no, that no, no, was the case. <laughs> um, that pretty much debunks the whole myth that from, comes from conservatives and even progressive liberals at times. Free college equals socialism. Nope. Wasn't free. It wasn't free, comrade. Wasn't really that good, apparently, either. <laughs> Very narrowly focused on just certain fields. And you didn't learn much about anything outside of your country. The peasant students entering the institute, usually in their late 20s, still had a village frame of mind at graduation time. They were trained to perform a specific function, and they knew that by doing that well, they were guaranteed housing, food, and a limited medical care plan. See? Limited medical care plan. Not unlimited. So limited just meaning like they'll take care of your teeth, they'll give you a checkup, they'll maybe do a few things here and there, but... It is what it is. Why waste energy learning more about the world? <laughs> it's so funny, too, because I remember Haas talking about the treasures of mankind and treasures of the world. And if he was like the leader, it's like, yeah, you would be reading that stuff. Your people? Uh, not so much. <laughs> it did not make any sense. They were by and large guided by the Russian street maxim. Make the most in the safe situation you are in. To break with the norm is to invite trouble or even death. The great majority of Russians were conditioned to accept their lot in life and be thankful for what they had. Stories of deprivation passed down through the generations, along with the specter of the NKVD knocking on the door at the middle of the night, sobered and haunted every home. Oh yeah, life is so fucking great under Stalin, wasn't it? What a bunch of, what a crock of shit. By now in the summer of 1944, still in the midst of the war, I had finished with my college education at the Institute. 
I faced a new problem. What to do with the extra time on my hands? I knew that when my mind was idle, I became restless and irritable. Now that I no longer had my engineering studies, I decided I should channel my energies into solving technical challenges at work. The first project I had in mind was the one that I'd been wanting to do for several years. The shop desperately needed more indicators, which were used for checking the varying type of precision gauges ground on the surface of grinding machines. The Soviet Union could not import them during the war, and no one in the factory knew how to make them. For every 10 machines, there was only one indicator. Workers were on the piecework system, and to wait for a fellow worker was to finish using the checking tool was extremely frustrating. I knew the results of this project would be welcomed by the workers, since it would increase their productivity. I knew I could make the indicators. One morning, I went to shop an hour early. I carefully measured an indicator and observed its movement. Then I went to my desk to design the measuring instrument. The indicator in use measured one one thousandth of an inch, which caused the workers quite an inconvenience because they would then have to convert their calculations from the fractions of an inch to a one one thousandth of a, one one hundredth of a millimeter units of measurement. Therefore, it was necessary to produce an indicator and the metric system that could read and be understood easily by the worker. When I showed the section head what I'd drawn and explained why I thought it should be produced in the shop, he seemed interested in the plan, though skeptical about whether I could produce it. Several designers assessed my plan and gave my idea some lukewarm, lukewarm reception. Nonetheless, the section had picked up the phone and called the chief shop superintendent to see if he could show him if I could show him my design. Ten minutes later, I received the call from the chief superintendent asking me to see him at once. When I entered his office, the chief engineer was looking over my drawing with the chief superintendent. He looked up and said, Comrade Robinson, I think you ought to know that it's not possible for us to make all these tiny parts in our shop. Yet I'm curious, how do you think it is how do you think you how do you think is capable of making what you have designed. No one in our shop, I said, but given the chance, I can do it. Neither man said anything for a few seconds. They looked at each other, surprised by my self-confidence. Finally, the chief engineer asked, suppose we agree to let you do this project. How long will it take you to finish it? In two or three months, providing I'm given access to whatever machine I need, to any machine whenever I need it. That's a promise we can't make, he said. What about allowing me to use the machines after my shift when many are usually idle, I asked. In that case, go ahead with the project, he said. Many of the other designers and instructors laughed in disbelief. When word of my plan reached them, one fellow came up to me and said mockingly, you are only a grinding instructor with two years as a designer to make what you have designed would require an ability to operate every machine in this shop. Fortunately, the day I decided to begin the project, our shop received three medium-sized German lathes brought home by Soviet troops as booty. I chose one of them to work on since they were better than anything we had. I ended up doing 70% of the of my work on that lathe. The first week of my project, everything was going well, but then I encountered trouble. One afternoon during my lunch hour, I went back to the shop to check the work I had done the previous night. A specially ground cutting tool that I had left on the machine was missing. I looked everywhere, I could not find it. I suspected sabotage. Five weeks later, trouble struck again. This time, someone had broken the cutting edge of the tool while leaving it mounted on the machine. From that day on, I always removed the cutting tool before leaving the plant. But this did not foil whoever was trying to sabotage my project because the person now started loosening the machine when I was not around. Several days later, when I turned on the machine, part of what I was working on flew out and hit me in the face. From then on, I took both the cutting tool and whatever piece I was building along with me even when I went to the bathroom. When I completed the indicator parts, I asked the shop superintendent if I could assemble them in my room to avoid further sabotage. He gave me permission. Three and a half months later, I arrived at the shop very early one morning, armed with the 13 complicated indicators. Seven of them were at 100, one of a hundred millimeter of each line and six were at one one thousandth of a millimeter for each line. I waited for either shop superintendent or the chief engineer to arrive. The superintendent showed up first. When he saw me, he said somewhat sarcastically, Well, Comrade Robinson, how is your tiny job coming along? I haven't seen you in ages. At first, I did not let on that I had finished the project. I simply said, It's all going all right. 
Then I picked up my box at my feet, placed it on his table, removed the 13 finish indicators. The man looked at me in disbelief, then picked up the indicators if it were a diamond, checking each side carefully while stealing glances at me out of the corner of his eye. Finally, he asked, have you checked them? And then letting me answer, he added, what's the result? If you wish, I said, we could check them together. Still holding on the indicators and shaking his head with amazement, he said, no, it can't be. How did you manage? I never thought you'd accomplish such an enormous task. The superintendent called the chief of the design department to come to his office immediately. Upon entering, this man looked at me and said, you have made fools of us all. <laughs> the Chad Black American, the Virgin Soviet. <laughs> The Virgin Soviets. Oh my gosh, it's funny. It's funny. He made fools of them because he understood the this stuff better than they did. <laughs> Only yesterday, a senior designer and I were wondering how we were doing. This is certainly a major contribution to our production effort. You are to be congratulated. News of what I was done, what I, of what I done, spread swiftly through the shop and plant even reaching Chief Engineer Gromov. I was pleased with my accomplishment and was enjoying myself thoroughly. The following morning, I received a message to report to the Chief Superintendent's office. When I arrived, Gromov was also inside the office. When he saw me, he reached out to shake my said and said, hand and said, congratulations, Comrade Robinson. Thank you for your contribution to the machine shop. I shall surely brief the factory's director about the notable deed. But it was the congratulations from my coworkers that meant the most to me. With the new indicators, they were going to make more money. Almost every worker in the shop came up to me and offered thanks by putting an arm around my shoulder and grabbing my hand and vigorously pumping it. Two weeks after completing the project, I received a phone call from the factory's trade union committee requesting that I meet with them. After work, I walked briskly over to the union office. But I never met with the committee. I was intercepted by the secretary who told me that the factory director had rewarded me a 12-day pass to a rest home along with 400 rubles, which would be 80 in American dollars at the time. Imagine that this was my reward for spending 105 extra work days creating instruments that were going to increase factory production significantly. The pass was worth 380 rubles, which meant a total of a 780 rubles, which in 1949 was equal to $156. Of course, I had done the work on my own initiative because I wanted to, but if I were to receive financial recognition at all, it should have been to commemorate with the task performed. What irked me was that others were given much more money for designing less meaningful devices. I calculated that I was paid $1.48 a day for my efforts. So yeah, he got congratulated, but what made him mad is that people built less meaningful and less useful devices and were just treated like, you know, they were still given more money. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really broken and bullshit system if you think about it. As a black man and a foreigner, I only received grudging recognition for my contributions from the industrial development of the Soviet Union. Rewards given me were always more of a spit in the eye than a pat on the back. Over the years, I garnered more than 20 awards, medals, and citations for my inventions and my work. However, none of those awards and nothing I ever did gained me a promotion or a significant pay raise. Well, my colleagues had graduated with me from the Moscow Evening Institute of Mechanical Engineering, had been promoted directors of factories, chief engineers of the factories, and the like. Four months later, I was shocked and saddened to learn from a worker that he and his colleagues were no longer allowed to use the new indicators. He came to ask if I knew what had happened. I checked with the woman in charge of the supply room who said they were being rechecked for accuracy and she had delivered them to the man in charge of testing. This was preposterous since the instruments were so new and there had been no report of inaccuracy, but the Soviet Union had an arcane system for rechecking all measuring requirements at regular intervals, whatever their condition. That time had arrived so the workers would have to do without the indicators for the time being. All that was needed 
to check them was a good set of Swedish measuring blocks. Instead, they were taken apart, washed in gasoline, and dried. They became all mixed up. To reassemble them correctly was a huge task. I went to the office of the man in charge of testing and was told that he was ill and had not been to work in more than a week. I wondered whether this was just another example of sabotage. Although I complained to the shop's chief engineer, the indicators were never returned. The chief engineer eventually questioned the man who was supposed to test them, who said that he had left the indicators in a drawer at his workbench. And when he returned, he could not find them. Several months later, a clue to their whereabouts surfaced. A machinist from the ball bearing plant in Kaibyshev told someone that in our shop they had received two new indicators. At first, I did not believe the story, but then another worker from the plant visited someone in our shop and confirmed what we had heard. I wondered if someone in the factory had laid claim to the work that I had done and shared it with other plants. Certainly, that kind of enterprise would impress the Ministry of Industry at the Kremlin and led to a promotion for someone. As far as I knew, the factory administration made no effort to find the culprit. About six months later, I learned that the Calabri factory in Moscow was producing vast numbers of indicators similar to the one I had produced. Yeah, so they took his indicators and uh, pretty much uh, used, stole them and used them in other factories. I mean, that, that's pretty wonderful, isn't it, everyone? Chapter 19, Rejoicing at the War's End. Oh, a second, guys. Got to get myself a short drink. We had sketchy news about the Red Army's advances, but what little we heard was good. By late April, we knew that Russian troops were in Germany. A few weeks later, they were approaching the gates of Berlin. It was rare to have news of the American and British forces on the Western Front. So the average Russian, it appeared that the Soviet Union was fighting the Germans alone. On May 2nd, 1945, Russian troops captured Berlin. There were pockets of German military resistance elsewhere in Germany. The remaining German armed forces surrendered to the Western Allies on May 8th and to the Soviet Union on May 9th, a day I shall never forget. I was in my shop when we learned that the war was over. The factory's whistle started blowing full blast. Everybody stopped working and started crying and hugging everyone in sight. When the shop superintendent and chief engineer emerged from their office, the workers hoisted them onto their shoulders and paraded them back and forth, singing patriotic Russian songs. The shop was shut down and everyone, workers, the foreman, the superintendent, the chief engineer, streamed onto the street in front of the factory. Thousands of people were already there. Elderly people who managed to survive the daily terror of Nazi bombings were crying like babies. Mothers with young children clinging to them cried without shame. Emotions had been building up for four desperate years were being released. Muscovites had endured hunger, bitter winters without fuel, the loss of loved ones in battles, and constant Nazi shelling and bombing. The Soviet Union had vanquished the seemingly invincible Nazi juggernaut. Young men and women kissed each other and danced together, singing Russia, Russia with deep emotion. Every soldier in the crowd was embraced, lifted up in the air, and passed from one set of outstretched hands to another. Tears of joy and relief were in every eye. Man, that had to be just like a huge emotional rush, you know, seeing something like that in person. The presence of so many people in the streets forced the tram cars and buses to stop running. The drivers abandoned them and joined in celebration. I had endured the hardships along with everyone else, and I rejoiced with them. Without reservation, around 1.30 p.m., the crowd began to disperse, many heading toward the center of Moscow, six miles away. Tram car conductors were offering people free rides along with others. I decided to take the subway, thinking I stood a better chance going underground than through the impassable streets. When I reached the subway station, I encountered a huge throng of people who were all trying to enter the train. While the inside were pushing to get out, the two masses of people created a human knot, before which the five or six policemen who were present were helpless. Men, women, and children were screaming. Somehow, the passengers inside managed to push their way through and out the swarm of people outside rushed to fill the vacuum. I never made it inside that train, nor did I get to the doors to the next one a few minutes later. 
35 minutes later, another train arrived. This time I was in the middle of the thong, which surged forward as the doors opened because only a handful of people wanted to get off. The crowd I was in prevailed. I was literally swept into the coach by an onrushing crowd, my feet never touching the ground. We were all packed together like fish in a can. Still, somehow a man began playing his accordion. Some Everyone joined in singing one song after another to the glory of Mother Russia. We were all heading for Red Square, but only about halfway there, about a thousand feet from the station, the train stopped abruptly. The crowd on the platform ahead spilled onto the tracks. Too impatient to wait, some people in our train pried loose the emergency valves and jumped onto the tracks. I learned later that a number of them were electrocuted. Oh my gosh, they got a little too <laughs> got a little too excited. They were electrocuted when they touched the high voltage rails. I stayed put and an hour later the train started moving again. I got off a stop stop before Red Square figuring out how the Red Square station would be impassable. When I emerged from the subway station, I'd walked a few blocks, I came upon Red Square, which I had expected was swarming with people. The streets feeding onto the square were just as densely packed. I squeezed my way along, finding my skin color an advantage because when people saw me, they let me pass, either because they thought I was a foreign dignitary or because they were afraid of me. As the crowd began chanting for Joseph Stalin to appear, I sensed they were acting just like their forefathers had in decades and centuries past when they came to shower affection upon and seek reassurance from the czars. To the hundreds and thousands of people massed in Red Square, Stalin was not viewed as the head of the Communist Party. He was, Instead, he was the leading Russian potentiate. He was their modern-day czar, who instead of defending the crown, defended the hammer and sickle. Hundreds of children carrying small bouquets of flowers stood in the crowd, hoping by for some miracle Stalin would come close to them and they could hand him their gift. We want to see Comrade Stalin, the people chanted. Long live Comrade Stalin! People wept as they chanted. We thank you for our victory. After two hours, the balcony above the Linen Mausoleum remained empty. The people were becoming restless and some began to pout. Before the disappointment turned to despair, the possible recklessness, something could be heard over the loudspeaker system. Everybody grew silent. People stood on their toes and strained for a clear view of the balcony. Those with children hoisted the little ones onto their shoulder. Nobody wanted to miss this rare appearance of Joseph Stalin at such a triumphant moment. But he was not there. No one was there. Instead, the radio continued to blare over the loud loudspeakers. Moscow is speaking. Moscow is speaking. Suddenly, of the voice of Stalin came over the radio. He was expressive as usual, but sparing of words. Although everybody listened attentively, the people in Red Square were extremely disappointed at not having seen Stalin in person. He rarely appeared in public, and whenever he did, he was surrounded by a battalion of guards. He kept the people over whom he ruled at a fearful distance. Crowd control on this day at Red Square would have been a desperate task at best. The short radio speech over the people started for home. From that year, May 9 became an official holiday in the Soviet Union. Each year, it reminds the people that Russia defeated Nazi Germany and won the war. The war was over now. Many people with husbands, sons, or brothers at the front were awaited expectantly, not only to find out for certain that if they were alive and safe, but also to see if they were allowed to return to their pre-war civilian life or if they would be kept in the military. I am sure everybody that I am sure that everybody also wondered as I did if the purges would begin again. In July 1945, a strange looking man showed up in the machine shop to remind us of the recent past. He had sunken jaws, was sabbily dressed, wearing coarse high boots that had not been cleaned for ages, yet somehow he looked familiar. Curious, I went to the foreman of the group of lathe operators and asked who the man was. Looking at the registration book, the foreman said, D. Bogatov. Bogatov, it seemed impossible, but the foreman repeated the name and I believed him. I wanted to desperately go over and talk to the man who disappeared from her shop in 1936, but I knew to do so would cause both of us to be viewed with suspicion. Exercising discretion, I gradually pieced his story together Bit by bit, it unfolded later. From snatches of conversation with him, I learned that after his arrest for commenting under his breath and about an unreasonable norm setter, 
Bogotov was taken to the Lafortevo prison. There he was interrogated constantly for three days and then convicted to 10 years imprisonment and a hard labor. He was packed to in a box car with 30 or so others and shipped off to a labor camp in Siberia. During the entire period traveling to the camps, especially at night, Bogotov told me, I kept on thinking about the unbelievably displeasing situation I was in, trying to find a reason for having done this to me. I wondered if I would survive and if I would ever see my mother and other relatives again. One moment after infinite hours of soul searching, I suddenly felt a sense of dread as I thought about the disagreement with the norm setter, Gerasimov. Two days later, before I was arrested, I was if it, it was if an inner voice were talking to me, saying, Do you remember what you said to Gerasimov as he walked away? Do you remember telling him that it is people like him who make life difficult? Yes, I remembered. Then I realized it was Gerasimov who had turned me into the NKVD in the secret department on our factory. Some weeks later, Vok Bogatov continued his story. At the first camp, we were told to cut wood with the daily norm set to a certain number of cubic meters. Anyone cutting less than the required norm would have his ration of black bread and buckwheat reduced. Perhaps one could say I was lucky for my fourth year at camp. I answered an announcement on the blackboard for an experienced toolmaker. The commandment accepted my service as a toolmaker. I not only made parts from an outdated lumber mill some four miles from the camp, but in time I was assigned two inmate helpers whom I gradually taught how to file and work on machines. Four and a half years later, one night, after I'd gone to bed, a casual thought about my mother crossed my mind. Then another and another until the thought became too strong to ignore. My heart was racing. I repeated to myself over and over again, why not ask the commandment permission to write it, your mother? When I awoke the next morning, the thought was still there. I took courage and went straight to the commandment. After the usual meeting, he praised me for my work and then asked me what he could do for me. Please, I've come to ask your permission to write to my dear old mother of Moscow, he said. Do you know Robinson, his whole demeanor changed. After a moment, he said, get in touch with my assistant Petrov in three days for an answer. Permission was granted and seven months later, I received a reply. I would read and reread her letter, each time my eyes filled with tears. For many months afterwards, I felt like an entirely new person inside. But a year later, I became ill with a high temperature. This began my bout of tuberculosis. In June of that year, the commandment went to Moscow, but no one knew exactly when he would return. As the weather began to grow cool in late August, I began to worry again about my health, which had improved considerably during the summer months. I ventured to ask, but how did you become free? Bogotov answered simply, through the help of my sister's party friends. And confidently, he said, I, I have been told that Gerasimov was responsible for at least the arrest and deportation of three other people, also on trumped-up charges. When I left the Soviet Union 29 years later in 1974, the same norm setter was still there. A number of people had told me that they were just waiting for an opportunity to get even with them for all this past treachery. I wondered if they ever got their revenge. At the end of August, a month after Bogotov returned, I used the vacation pass I was given for my work on the indicators. I had not had a vacation in more than four years. Needless to say, I welcomed the opportunity to retreat to a country setting where I could lose myself in nature and refresh my spirit. Before the war, my summer trips to the Crimea or Caucasus Mountains were a welcome respite for the intrigue and anxiety of life in Moscow. Not that a citizen was free of snooping of the internal security system while on vacation. The NKVD and its informers were at rest homes at will, but the trees, clear sky, and sea breezes made things more tolerable. A regular vacation was usually 12 work days, plus two Sundays. For ordinary people, and a total of 28 days for those high up in bureaucracy, my 12-day holiday was scheduled for a rest home 65 kilometers from Moscow. I got there. The long line at the registration desk immediately reminded me of Moscow. I took my place on the line, which moved slowly because the policeman checking credentials was being excessively thorough. Upon registering, I was required to hand over my passport, pay a three-day ruble registration fee. Then I was given a booklet, which had my room number and number of the table I'd be eaten written on the cover. The booklet also included a list of items I could borrow and use in my spare time, things such as a balalaika, an accordion, chess pieces or checkers, 
a tennis racket and ball, books, a volleyball and net, and other sporting equipment. A rest home nurse took me and other guests to our rooms. There were no private rooms. Only the vacation places catering to the highest stratum of the Soviet elite had private facilities. And the places I was staying, the best you could get was one roommate. Though I was not that lucky. Those rooms usually went to guests who registered the night before they were supposed to arrive. I was placed in a room with three other men and the guests who arrived hours after me found themselves in a dormitory room with five to seven roommates. There were precisely the number of chairs in a room. There were occupants regardless of the number of guests in the room. There was one decanter filled with water and two glasses turned upside down. The beds were narrow, two towels with a hook in the head of each bed. There was a bathroom on each floor in a wooden two-story building, which was shared by 200 people. Hot water was available every other day in the morning for men and the afternoon for women. Every room had at least one window. Ours had two with white curtains, and there were no maid services. Everyone had to change his own bed. Clean bed sheets and pillowcases were provided every 12 days. On the third floor was a large sitting room, which could hold more than 100 people comfortably. In a far corner was a library open for two hours in the morning and two hours in late afternoon. On rainy days and cool nights, people would relax in the sitting room, playing cards, chess, or checkers, and gossiping. An accordionist might play Russian folk songs, and the more energetic folks would dance. There was also a radio in the room, but it did not work. The two most important people at rest homes were gymnast and the accordionist. The gymnasts were generally women trained at a special sports institute, majoring in recreation studies. The gymnasts would plane I mean, would plan the daily activities announcing 15-minute session of morning calisthenics, which started promptly at 7.45 a.m. Calisthenics were optional, but I nevertheless felt compelled to attend for fear of being considered a deviationist and facing social ostracism during my stay. Breakfast was served at 8.30 a.m. on a first floor room with 50 tables and four chairs to a table. A vase with freshly picked wildflowers rested on each table. The meal was identical each morning, herring, a slice of black bread, and a quarter ounce of butter, porridge, and a glass of tea. After breakfast, on the first morning of a 20-minute hike led by gymnasts and the accordionist, we walked and the accordionist played popular Soviet tunes and the gymnasts led us in a song until we reached a spot where we were divided into groups of four or five. Some researched for mushrooms, others picked berries, some rolled up their pants and wadded into a nearby pond. A soccer ball was brought along for those who wanted to do something athletic. At 12.45 p.m., the gymnast blew her whistle as a signal to resemble for another 15-minute session of calisthenics. We tried to touch our toes and do push-ups to the rhythm of the accordionist tunes, accordionist tunes, and then singing, we hiked back to the rest home. We were given about 10 minutes to get ready for lunch, one of the three most important events of the day. Living in hunger during the war years had created most people an obsession with food. This was clearly noticeable when we sat down to eat. Most of the men in the dining hall gulped down their food, unaware or uncaring for their primitive behavior. The three men at my table tested me dearly. They devoured their food, and since I'm always a slow eater, they spent the next 10 to 15 minutes watching me eat. I ate my borscht. I ate my four tablespoons of buckwheat, my three ounces of meat, and my glass of dried fruit. All three of them sat there staring. The saliva would drip down out of the mouth of one of them. Oblivious, he would suck it back and swallow it without ever taking his eyes off my food. I could feel them studying my spoon as I went from my food to my mouth and back to my plate for more. I felt as if three ravenous bloodhounds were waiting to pounce. During my stay, on the occasions when I left a few scraps on my plate, I would hear them arguing over who should get what was on what I get what I get what as I was on my way out. Okay, no, no, I said that wrong. I would hear them arguing who should get what as I was on my way out. Second helpings were given, but never of meat or dried fruit. Usually after considerable pleading, the kitchen would dish out more buckwheat or potatoes. After lunch, we were encouraged to take a two-hour nap. It was not mandatory, but those who did not were not allowed to loiter in or around the rest home. They usually took walks in the woods or down a country lane. 
at 5 p.m. We had the choice of playing some athletic games like volleyball, listening to propaganda lecture about the international communist movement, or taking a walk. Most of the women went for a stroll, and a few men with romance on their minds followed. Afterward, it was a time for supper, and people filed into the dining hall as they had for lunch, as if they were starving. I was also hungry, but I did not relish the idea of having three sets of eyes riveting on my food. For supper, we were given four spoonfuls of mashed potatoes, a cutlet, which consisted of 85% black bread crumbs and 15% meat, and weighed about 70 grams. We were also served a dish of porridge and, of course, a glass of tea. I soon learned that the more creative and determined guests found a way to secure food outside the dining hall. Each morning, the same group of men skipped the after-breakfast excursion and headed five miles down the road to a pavilion to check out what was being sold there. Curious about what they might be purchasing, I followed one of, one of them in the morning. When I reached the little pavilion, I noticed that most of the men at the counter were buying vodka and a flat, dried, bony fish less than five inches long called Vobla. They had been saturated in salt, I observed one of the guests in the rest ho home sitting by himself, sipping vodka and devouring fish. In a matter of minutes, he had eaten 10 fish. Another man was seated on the ground, his pockets bulging with cucumbers. About a dozen more were piled between his legs. He was greedily chomping one cucumber after another, eating them without condiments or bread. Before eating a fresh one, he would wipe, he would wipe it with the handkerchief and then plop it in his mouth. I counted after the 11th cucumber. He got up satisfied and headed back to the home. Many of the other men had cucumbers stuffed in their pockets and a bottle of vodka hidden inside their shirts. I wondered where they got the vegetables because I did not see them being sold at the pavilion. The shelves were stocked out only with the ever-present jars of mustard, black pepper, vodka, black bread, hard tasteless biscuits, and ordinary candies stuck to one Another. I learned later from a waitress in the dining hall that the peasants arrived at, every, at nine every morning with sacks full of cucumbers, which they sold to the rest of the home guests. Every evening, there were activities coordinated by the gymnasts designed to create a family-like atmosphere and to help the guests to get to know one another. They were usually dancing and games. Nearly everyone would show up for dancing. On the day before departure, there would be skits and concerts performed by the staff members and guests. On this occasion, I missed the performance. I decided that my table mates had become too much to bear when their usual argument over my food erupted into a fight. I returned to Moscow three days early. So chapter 20 is going to be a touch of romance. So anyways... Anyone who wants to come on and discuss a couple things, I'll throw the link out there. Um, if nobody comes on, then we'll just call it day for this stream. But this was some interesting stuff for sure. It's kind of fun, you know, um, learning about how they had to pay for college. It's kind of funny how um, no matter what he did for the country, they just seemed to be just... Uh, they seem to just kind of screw them over. And it's also kind of funny learning that college education was extremely narrow and people really didn't learn too much from it. it just doesn't seem to help. So let's see what Jake has to say. So what, <laughs> so what did you think of these last two chapters? Yeah, I, well, um, uh, quite interesting although I, I although i missed the previous two but uh, still um well <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> yeah, it's funny because well well it is uh, it, it is true that uh, the education was in fact uh, uh you had you had to pay for it uh, i think it was only in the only after only after Stalin that they decided to, uh, um, I think it was like in '56, I believe, uh, that uh, the new universities became f uh, like free. Is although there were some um, some uh, well, the devil was in details, but you know, 
so but yeah <laughs> and um, i mean um this i mean it's especially sh showing what uh, um like i really like how, how like some on, on those details about uh, the life in it i mean i just uh, um um it, it just it just really i mean once again i i i, I real i i really like this book <laughs> because i mean i don't think i have ever, ever seen like so, such an um like an all, honest look at and with all with all its um with all its details and <laughs> and uh, so so yeah i i i like it really yeah that's for sure what's your thoughts on the education system well <laughs> yeah mm. and not <laughs> i'm not um, opinion not not great really not great as you can see like you, you such as like such as scarce uh the topics it's like like it's, there's barely over two topics as you saw right i mean but it's just uh, really funny because they only teach like what they, they only teach the students what kind of occupation to do and then all the other education they're given is just you know party propaganda party history and some communism stuff here and there yeah and then they don't but then they don't even know where indonesia and jamaica are on a map and much less understand other cultures yeah i mean like although the topics became like uh, a bit broader with time but but uh, still you can see that it's it's absolutely not as the the uh, you know the commies uh, who would like to portray it's absolutely not that <laughs> that's not the case yeah no it started to expand after the death of stalin but yeah. during the time of stalin that's why it's really rich hearing an infrared talk about how great stalin was yeah and yeah. when you actually look at life under stalin life was actually pretty narrow and very limited yeah and also um you know regarding the you know the uh the second chapter you write about uh, how people will, were grateful that the war ended that's although that's well indeed but <laughs> you have to remember that <laughs> some you know many other ethnicities were uh, exiled to like you know K K kazakhstan and <laughs> other <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, because the thing is, is like Stalin is not like the monster that his haters portray him as, but he's certainly not like some benevolent, kind-hearted, and gentle leader either. Yeah, like yeah, like he, he was, like, but still, yeah, I, I do agree with him as like very flawed in, in many uh, deeds yeah he was a very paranoid person who always tried to make sure that um who always tried to to protect his ass first and foremost you know no matter what yeah i mean uh, yeah it's still so yeah it's still just you know just still so funny to me to hear that uh uh, you know the uh, you know the commies demands that you need to give justice to Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's um, why I found it hilarious that Inverhoja of all people tried to just like think that oh I can copy this guy and then yeah like that's you saw how that worked out. Yeah, I mean he even well as you, saw, <laughs> I mean uh, as we saw in history even. <laughs> uh you know even uh, <laughs> he even want to like he, like he went even harder like you know like uh 
later on completely banned uh, banning all religions. Yeah, no, he went harder than Stalin, and all that really resulted in is like maybe ten, maybe five or ten good years of development, and then afterwards just stagnation. Well, yeah, and then, and then after his death, uh, his successor just. Uh, Hmm. You know, I think it's it's just time to drop cameras. Yeah. Well, it was funny too because it's 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 obvious stagnation is going to happen if you don't really allow freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of you know. If you if you basically force people to just be um, indoctrinated sheep that can't think for themselves, and you and you ha and you give them like such a narrow worldview, and you don't allow them to have any kind of freedom. It's no wonder that like countries like that are just going to stagnate and be underdeveloped. And how do you feel that like Robert was able to invent all this stuff that was able to produce like better uh, machinery than like even their educated students can produce? Mm. Well, it, it, it does show here he was uh, pr pr um, he was a pretty talented, and it's a well, it is a pretty it was injustice that he wasn't given like um like proper rewards for probably his like he basically is like for for all we saw he basically done like almost all most of the job yeah he did like he pretty much innovated the soviet industry all by himself through his, his inventions and sure they gave him some medals and some rewards but they also never gave him a pay raise they never allowed him to travel out of the country to talk about you know the wonders of the soviet you know yeah well he, well he 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 he, he did perfectly describe in chapter uh well yeah in chapter 19 it was uh that you know the soviet union just uh, doesn't want you have to, 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 to develop the develop the the develop mind you just need to um Just, just follow, just follow the rules. Yeah, exactly. And see, like it, it's crazy because when he first came to the Soviet Union, you could still see that there was a lot of Lenin and the Bolsheviks influence in the country. Mm -hmm. And then you could tell, like after the purges, Stalin's influence starts becoming a lot more prominent. Yeah. Yeah, we do, we do, we definitely see it. I mean, even no, I'm, well. <clears throat> uh, no, well, not only through this book, but many other, uh, well, you know, history articles and, and so on. That, I mean, I mean, that, that's why, <laughs> I mean, I, that, that's why I think it, it's even, even more injustice that, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, other, uh, um, you know, oh, I, I, why? Because you see, I, 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 I always see like you know other blacks who you know <laughs> who spoke highly of the living in the USSR, but no mention of Robertson like uh, at all. I didn't see it any mention. So that's that's completely crap. Yeah, exactly. But it is crazy because he does all this stuff for the country and all they they just didn't really um give him the respect that he deserved and then he just wanted out of there eventually. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, going back to the Stalin thing too, it's like he came to a country that was egalitarian, anti racist, anti fascist, and then all of a sudden, you know, it just becomes like this fucking cult where everybody's just like a damn uh it's like yeah. a fucking religion where everybody's just like indoctrinated into the cult and they're told, you know, follow the leader. The lead, what the leader says is right. Never question our leader. Yeah, I mean. So um Yeah, I mean, it's not I think it, it was only only good for him to eventually leave. It was good, but it also is good to show that even Stalin doing what he did never even had the foresight to think that he was going to have a successor that 
you know, steered the country in the same direction. He just sort of like didn't he underestimated Khrushchev. Yeah. And he also underestimated how people within the party felt about him because yeah, he just didn't think that way. He he just wanted to purge who he thought needed to be purged and just didn't know what was happening underneath them. I mean, he just, he just didn't know. And it was funny because, you know, I was reading a book about Pol Pot and Pol Pot did a bunch of purging and, and the purging and the shitty um, living conditions for the workers because workers weren't even allowed to forage for food. They could get punished for that. So it weakened mm -hmm. morale so much that it made it super easy for Vietnam to, to just kick this crap out of them in a war. Mm. Well, yeah, no wonder. <laughs> and then halfway through, they just started to ban, like Pol Pot and the, and, the, and the Khmer Rouge leadership just completely abandoned the rest of the Khmer Rouge and left them, <laughs> left them to basically fend for themselves against, uh, <laughs> against the Vietnamese. And of course, predictably, they got defeated. But see, the problem with Pol Pot is he's an example of what happens when you go too far to the left and think that that's a way of doing communism because he was influenced by Peter Kropotkin's book on the French Revolution. And it goes to show that like left, far left communism has the shelf life. It has, um, I was going to like compare it to something like give an analogy, <laughs> but uh it didn't really have a shelf life it, it expires really it, it expired really quickly yeah <laughs> because no. what happens is when you weaken the state like that you don't really have like any strong military or any strong defense against invaders and you just get crushed yeah even well as you saw <laughs> even china didn't help much but at least China knows how to properly run a state by giving the people the, th the food they need, making yeah. sure there's – like China knows what they're doing more so than most communist countries did. But oh my gosh, you can't, you can't do that. That's revisionism. <laughs> my, yeah. my revisionism. <laughs> yeah, my, my horror, my evil revisionism. <laughs> it's so well, these people are idiots, honestly. Yeah. They're so they're so narrow minded and they're 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 just as bad as like um they're just as bad as a brainwashed religious follower. I mean myself I'm a I, my, and what I'm saved by that I'm not talking about like traditional religions like traditional Christianity or mm -hmm. a Buddhism or anything of that nature. I'm talking about just these people that get into cults and they have no like ability to think for themselves. Yeah, I see that. And also speaking of uh, narrow-minded, um, I <laughs> I did uh, although I wasn't on the stream unfortunately, but I did saw that a bit of uh, non-compete. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. What was your thoughts on it? Because infrared did a good takedown of it, so I just covered the pus the parts that infrared didn't yeah. cover. Yeah, for all, what I saw was just. I mean, as soon as I heard the uh, ultra nationalist look, and I already understood, I already knew what I, what I was facing. <laughs> oh yeah, like when he said ultra nationalist, it's like, oh yeah, this guy didn't read much Dugan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I I read a tiny. I read a couple paragraphs from Fascism Borderless and Red. It's like that's yeah. the stuff he wrote early. <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's like that one early church father who wrote against heresies or like T T Tertullian who later became a heretic. It's like you ju you don't judge people by what time period they wrote their work. You judge it people on the work alone. It's like Warner Sombart was like that. He uh, started out, um, you know, on one end and then just kind of went the other way. Yeah. I mean, although, well, you know, the, that uh, that take wasn't surprising to yeah, since you, well, I do remember, <laughs> uh, well, all his 
old uh, crunchy, you know, this uh, those, those freaking uh, videos with uh, puppets and uh, even some bad attempt at rap. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, honestly, he should have just stuck with the puppets and did kid shows. Yeah, you know, I think he, I think he should have just uh, kept with uh, his all his uh, previous uh, liber libertarian <laughs> politics. Yeah. yeah, he should have stuck to the libertarianism. Uh, do you believe that absolute power corrupts absolutely? Or that it more depends on the character of the leaders who willed it? Um, I think it's a combination of both. But that is a really good question because there are people who aren't like really like evil or corrupt people at first glance. But once you give them power, they just make really horrible decisions. And they just, do, and they just create like a super corrupt and horrible society. Then there's other people that are just genuinely horrible people that do create terrible societies. And then there are like the good, there are like, you know, um, leaders who just do really good things and do the best for their people. Like it depends on who it is. Like if you get someone like Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping was a great leader. Yeah. Mao, he made some terrible mistakes, but he made good observations on revolution and his cultural revolution, unlike anything else in communist history, actually allowed peasants to overthrow corrupt party members. And that's something that like a lot of communist, you know, ideologues don't really like to talk about is like overthrowing their own people. If, if letting, letting the peasants or the or the proletariat or whatever, you know, just letting their own people overthrow like party officials or corrupt <laughs> members of the party. I mean, that's just a big no-no in most communist circles because they think the communist leadership is always right and democratic centralism or the party line must be followed at all costs. Uh, no, nah, let, let the people just feel the anger. <laughs> but that's why I don't really consider myself a communist because like, I may agree with a lot of what Marx and Engels wrote when they talked about what capitalism does and their understanding of capitalism. But after that, I, I kind of just check out mentally with all the author authors that come in the picture. Yeah, I yeah, I also agree with it. I'm I'm really like already at this point. I'm just uh, like tired of uh, all this uh, like in like in nonsense uh, claims and and propaganda. So. Yeah, exactly. Because you go back to Marx and Engels, it's all about philosophy and speculation. And then when you go to everybody else later on, especially Marxist-Leninist thinkers and Maoist thinkers and all these other people, it's all just propaganda and mostly just propaganda. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I hope that... Uh, uh we'll, we'll have something well well we'll, we'll have something better than, uh, than something better with communism i think it's kind of it's well already i think it's kind of gay because it's getting old yeah i mean it's not to say that lenin didn't have some good writings but then lenin's writings on imperialism were inspired by a liberal you know author uh, Mao had some good writings. Stalin had a few good writings, but yeah. um, they—I don't think everything they write should just be treated like religious texts. I think people should like, ha you know, have an open mind and not just like dogmatically follow every single word they put on paper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You should just, you know, all this uh, writings. You should, you like, you. Like the point is, you should learn from them, not not to not to treat them as the Bible, because that that's just uh, like that. That's not how it works. No, and there's a lot of Christians that don't even know how to read the Bible properly. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So. 
yeah i mean you know at this point i'm just uh, kind of although i some i sometimes I check up some like uh, uh, some uh, you know like come use communities you know, well, just, well mostly for just uh, like books or information but uh, it's, well, like it's but it, like it's mostly just a com comedy <laughs> yeah yeah i've kind of i've kind of just grown to take it less seriously because over time it just gets boring to listen to because you already know they're going to talk about class and historical materialism and they're not even going to say they're not even really even go into what marx was saying himself it's mostly just um going to be like all his you know all the people who came later like the mls and stuff and you already know what MLs are going to talk about imperialism, class warfare, blah, blah, blah. And then the, like the really dogmatic ones are going to talk about, Oh, you know, we need to abolish capitalism, but Marx himself never even said that Marx said that the mode of product capitalism would eventually turn into monopoly. And his worldview is that once one mode of production transforms into another mode of production, it's the communist job to point out the contradictions and then sublate that with a different system. Yeah. Well, with a different. Yeah, but uh, but you know you have well you have to read and uh, and some people uh, don't find reading necessary. <laughs> no, they want to read what's approved to them. They don't want to read actually anything on a, with an open-minded point of view, and that that's the problem is because um, they like to gatekeep too much. And the problem with all that is as well is like, I would say that like America right now isn't even a capitalist country. I mean, libertarians and ANCAPs are right to say that it's not capitalism, but uh, a lot of like mainstream communists and socialists are wrong to say that it is capitalism as well, because like infrared does get it right. Like cause of infrared does get it right that he says it's a different mode of production. Well, yeah, it, well, it certainly is the, like, it certainly is different. Yeah, it is because we went away from industry, from heavy industry, and we, it changed, it transformed into the service industry now. And that's going to basically give way to things like AI, um, automation, and other things of that nature. So, yeah, like some sort of cyberpunk. <laughs> right that's if we get there myself i'm starting to become a lot more influenced by traditionalist thinkers or thinkers you know from the new right or just the german conservative revolution so i'm starting to just kind of view the progress itself as just the beginning of the end so i mean it's nice to think that we're going to get like this um agi skynet future but i mm -hmm. think we're going to get something completely different than that Oh, probably. I I think honestly, once the barbarians or the vandals are at the gate, uh, yeah, they that's that's it, you know. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, we're seeing actually the decline of the West. We're not really seeing like we're not really seeing like the golden age of it or the bet or the West at its best. I mean, all I have to do is walk at, outside and see what's around me, and what I see isn't progress. It's 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 the opposite of that, and. I think, you know, progress is just an oxymoron because it looks like progress on the surface, but it is actually just, you know, mm -hmm. it is just like the winter time of a society's life cycle. Yeah, just this. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. It... <laughs> I mean, it's really funny to think that, like, uh, um, you know, I think when... Spengler wrote about uh, <laughs> in in his book like about hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, Rene Guénon was also uh, speaking quite well about that, and I'll I'll link a video on the chat because there's this um, guy named Chad Hag who covers philosophy, and he did a really good um, he did a really good uh, review of. Guanon's crisis of the modern world. 
So I'm going to link that in the chat for those who are curious. Because the crisis of the modern world does kind of bring a really good uh, perspective of what's actually happening today and how it's really not going to benefit anyone in the long run. Exactly, control view. That's right. The soy industry versus heavy industry, fake economy versus producing real things. And that is, that's what it is. It's, we've transitioned. The mode of production is now becoming a fake economy. And we're transitioning away from, you know, the capitalism, the free market, and all this other stuff. And we've seen all these companies become monopolies. And, yeah, it's it's going to turn into something that nobody really wants to have, but it's just inevitable. So usually, like, when we get to this point in society, we're just, like, you know, a few, you know, decades or a few centuries away from dictatorship and decay. But anyways, sure. that's it for today. Um yeah, I'll see good. all of you on the next stream. Yeah, good stream. I see you. Thank you. And and before I go, check out that video I've linked in the chat, and make sure to subscribe to Chad's channel. Anyways, catch go you ahead. all later. See you.